We are continuing in our series uh, in James. And in James, uh, we are, uh, the, the, the series is entitled uh, The Marks of a Christian. Basically, we are looking to answer the question, uh, what does a Christian look like? And we're, we're, we're doing this series for two reasons. The first is that we want you to know uh, what God expects of us. And so um, in your coming on a week-to-week -week basis over the course of this series, uh, you will have a very clear idea of what God expects of us as his children and what God expects of us as his, um, as his soldiers, that we are to, uh, be, uh, that, that we are to be active uh, in the um, active in obedience, active in submitting to his word, and in doing his word. So the first thing is we want you to know what God expects of us. Secondly, uh, we feel that this sermon series provides a great opportunity for you to invite your friends. And so that's the series. That's the reason for the series. We're looking to answer what does a Christian look like? And if, uh, and if the 40 of you who came in late are wondering why I am extra excited today, extra peppy, it's because you guys look really tired, and I need to wake you up. And so this is what you're going to be looking at for the next 40 minutes. Lots of pep, right? There's going to be cheerleader pep, and then there's going to be quan pep. All right, so this is going to be great. It's going to be amazing, all right? So your Bibles, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. And we are going to be, uh, and you are going to have uh, the word open there. Uh, extra passages will be on uh, the PowerPoint uh, today. Um, over the course of the series so far, we have been looking at, uh, we, we've done, I believe, three marks of a Christian. First, uh, you are, um, for, first, a Christian is marked by, or a Christian looks like, a servant or slave of God. Secondly, a Christian is marked by those who suffer with hope and with joy. Thirdly, a Christian is not someone who hears the word of God, but is a doer of the word of God. Today, uh, we are going to be looking at the fact that a Christian is someone who loves without partiality. And so, Verse 1, uh, verse 1, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Your, uh, uh, in the NIV, my brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Christians are not to show favoritism or bias, either positively or negatively, to any one particular People group. So the word partiality um, is in the Bible is used to describe um, is used to describe God more specifically. It's used to describe the way He judges. And so uh, there, I threw up three passages for you in Romans chapter two, verse eleven. God shows no partiality in His judgment of Jews and Gentiles, so He doesn't really care about race or culture. He judges all the same. Ephesians chapter six, verse nine. He shows no partiality in His judgment towards masters and slaves. So social status, net worth, doesn't care. We are all judged by the same standard. First Peter chapter 1, verse 17, God judges all without partiality. So he judges everybody without partiality. There is, the sa there is a sameness and an equality in how God judges. He is blind to our appearance. He is blind to the color of our skin. He is blind to our intellect. He is blind to our net worth. He is blind to our social status. None of that affects his judgment of us. There is no partiality in his judgment. There is a sameness in his judgment to us. Sameness, I looked it up, it's not a word. Uh, there will be a lot of made up words today, but that's only because want to make sure you guys are paying attention. Um, so uh, there is a sameness in how he um, judges us. And if we are to relate that to our passage and our context, uh, there is a sameness in our love and service to one another. There, is, there ought to be no difference in how we demonstrate love from one people group to another. It doesn't matter what you look like, how much you make, Right, what your standing is, how many letters you have before your name, and how many letters you have after your name, it does not matter. We are to love one another the same. People groups, the same. Now, to be perfectly clear, Jesus and James is not telling us to treat everybody the same. Right? That would be very silly advice from a very wise man. Let me just give you two really quick examples. You should not, gentlemen, you should not treat the girl next door the same way you treat your wives, right? That 
would be bad. Okay. All right, I understand. Energy levels here, pep here. All right, okay, so let's try that again. Gentlemen, you should not treat your wives the same way as you would treat the girl next door because that would be sinful, right? That would be bad. You guys now laugh. Ridiculous. All right, uh, I give up. <laughs> I give up. Okay, cheerleader pep, quan pep. All right, we're going to match that. Okay, you are to be, you, you are not to treat everybody the same because God has given you a certain set of responsibilities and a certain uh, circle of relationships whom you are to care for, whom you are to, uh, who, whom you are to um, take care of. And so, yes, you are to love your wife more than, uh, or your spouse more than you are to love regular people. You are to love your children more than you love regular people. Jesus is not telling you to treat everybody the same. James is not telling you to treat everybody the same. Rather, he is telling us to treat all people groups the same and to include and to receive them into the church. Remember that this is a church context teaching. This is not me coming up to you and being like, hey, bro, you got to, you know, can't differentiate. This is James coming to the congregation and saying, this is what's happening. You need, uh, we, are, we are treating different people differently. You need to treat everybody the same, all people groups the same. All right, I will show you an example of partiality from our passage, verses 2 to 4. The rich were being treated as more important than the poor. Right? And their deeds, we have to understand. So this is not just a matter of the way you were acting towards someone. This is a matter of the way people thought about and felt about others. Right? Their actions were a reflection of their attitudes. They treated the rich better because they thought the rich were better. They thought the rich were worth more. They thought the rich were more important. And so the rich were treated better. Conversely, the poor were treated as secondary citizens. The poor were treated, you know, the, the poor were given the worst seats. And if there were no seats, they would be told to sit on the ground or they would be told to sit in front of the rich so that the rich would have somewhere to put their Bibles, right? It was one of those things where the rich were treated with great respect, with great worth, with great importance. The poor were treated like not people, And what I want us to see is that the church there had made a distinction. They had made a judgment. They'd said, rich guys, you guys, amazing, right? Electric sign outside, rich people, welcome. Come in, we'll treat you well. You are welcome. You are worthy. God loves you. Poor people, uh, you know, maybe, maybe if there's some seats left over, you can, you, can sit on, you, you can sit next to those seats, right? Just in case, towards the end of service, there's no one taking those seats, then you can take them. Because really, poor people, I don't really care about you. I don't really care about you. And that was, that was what was going on in the church, um, in James's church. And James was saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. Right? We should not act like that. We should not assign worth to some and to belittle others. Christians are those who love all people groups equally. Right? We are to live in a way where we show that all people are equally worthy of love and respect and acceptance. Now, I think, I think that most of us in this room would agree to that sentiment. I hope that most of you would agree to this sentiment. And so rather than spend more time on defining the commandments, I want us to spend our time looking at the reason why we ought to and why we need to love all people groups equally. We need to love all people the same because God loves all people equally. Verse 5 of our passage. Listen, my Beloved, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in the faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Uh, 
Now, when you read this passage, at first it doesn't sound like partial. It doesn't sound like impartiality either. It actually sounds like uh, God likes the poor more than he likes the rich. But that's not true. The reason why James doesn't mention the rich is because it is assumed that God wants to bless the rich. It's assumed that God has chosen the rich in the world to also be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. If you look at those who are rich, right, your gut instinct is to think, man, God has blessed them with so much. And you would tend to look at the poor and you would look at someone who is homeless and you would, th- and you would not... Or what you would think is, God, God kind of gave him the short end of the stick. God kind of gave him the short end of the stick. Now that's wrong, right? That's, that's not true, but that's, but that's a gut reflex, right? I mean, if we were to be honest with ourselves, if you were to look at someone who was rich, someone who was affluent, someone who was successful in this world, you would say, God really blessed them. And you look at someone who is really down and out, who is jobless, who is poor, who is living you know, on welfare, you would say, ah, you know, I know I shouldn't be thinking this way, but I really think that God, you know, might have missed the blessing train with that guy, right? He was handing out blessings and he kind of just skipped this person. And it's gut reflex, Right? It's, it's what we instinctively have. And, so, uh, and, and if we think, if we feel that way now, uh, we need to understand that in the first century, these feelings were not just subtle, you know, subliminal, I'm ashamed to think this way feelings. These feelings were blatant. They, they were out there in the culture. And so in the culture, if you were blessed, if you were rich, they would say, God has blessed you. And if you were poor, they would say, oh, man, like, you must have done something wrong because God surely is not blessing you. This was explicit in the culture. And so when James is speaking specifically about how God has chosen the poor, he is speaking into the culture, and he's saying, you need to realize that as a church and as And as God's children, that God did not just choose the rich to be a part of his family, he has also chosen the poor. James is correcting faulty thinking. He is saying Jesus loves the rich and he loves the poor and he loves them equally. Right? He doesn't have a prejudice or a bias against anyone. He is for everyone. Where right? We cannot fall into the trap of thinking that God does not like poor people. That's the prosperity gospel. Right? That is saying that God... God has blessed the rich, and he has not blessed the poor. That is prosperity gospel. That is heresy. That is a lie. And conversely, you can't flip all the way to the other side, and you you can't say, well, God loves the poor more than he loves the rich. That is poverty gospel. That is also heresy. That is also lie. God has blessed all people, loves all people equally. He is for everyone. There is a sameness and an equality in the way he treats all people groups. Now, theologically, we can root this sameness by looking at two events. We can look at the creation and we can look at the cross. There are two events in human history where we can identify and root our sameness in, theologically. And that is creation and cross. So let's say creation first. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him under a male and female. He created them. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He created men and women. He created black and white. He created rich and poor. He created smart and not smart. He created all of us. And he created all of us to be equal. And we see this equality in the man and woman relationship. Men and women are unique and we are different in how we function and we complement one another, right? We are not the same. Right? Anatomically, we are not the same. 
right? I'm not saying, you know, guys like sports, girls like art different. I'm saying that there is difference in how we've been made. Physically, physiologically, we are different. But in substance, in worth, in importance to God, we are the same. And this is not just something that we, can, that, that we can say between man and woman. This is something that we can say in a broader sense that God has created us all unique, right? I'm not the same as, I, I'm not the same as Reverend Ted, not the same as Curtis, and I'm thankful that we are all different, right? Because God has created us all unique, all with a unique mission, all with a unique personality to reach unique, different people groups. And I think that's beautiful. But we are all the same. We are all equal in substance and in worth. God has created us all to be equal in that realm. We must realize that he created us all to be equal in substance, in worth, and importance. So, secondly... He also died for all of us equally. There are two passages that I threw up, uh, and the one passage that I will read is uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. And that is this. It's one of the most famous passages in um, in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. We see that Jesus died for the rich and for the poor. He died so that everyone can have the opportunity and anyone will have the opportunity to repent of their sins, commit to him, receive him as their Lord and Savior. There is no partiality. He didn't die more for the rich. He didn't die more for the Chinese. He didn't die less for the whites. He died for all of us Equally, he didn't die more for the rich. He didn't need the he didn't need the smart people more. And and so, okay, I'm going to die for them. I guess you know I'll take the dumb people along with me. That's not how it went. He died for all of us equally. And he died for all of us. And I think that that's such amazing news. Because if you think about that for a moment, that means that everyone is eligible for salvation. That's amazing news, right? Right, let's raise the pep just a little bit, guys. You guys look like I'm, I'm speaking at a eulogy and someone died. This is ridiculous. Right? The person that died is Jesus, and that's good news because that means that you should be here and that you should be excited to hear the word of God. He has died for you. Excited? Amen? Amen. Ah, oh, thank you. All right. Pep, back down. All right, but you need to go from here, dead men, to hear, all right, cheerleader pep, don't expect that, but I expect somewhere in that realm, in that range, all right? All right. Jesus died for you. Excellent news, yes, yes. All right, I was pointing at somebody that did not respond to me, that's okay. Jesus died for you, yes, amen? Terrence, it's you, yes, all right. Excellent. You need to know that Jesus died for all, that everybody is able and welcome into this place for worship because Jesus died for all. That is amazing news. No one is barred from worship. That is the best news that you can tell anybody because that means that nobody, nobody has been neglected or excluded by God. And I think that in this world where prejudice and bias run and reign extreme, that there is no better news than the fact that God looks at you and says, I want you as much as that guy, 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 as much as that guy. And if you ever had to doubt that, all you had to do is look at the cross. Those nails, his blood, his death. For you. 
My Bible teacher once told me that, uh, that, that, that you could uh, take uh, John 3.16, uh, theologically, I don't know how correct this is, but, but, it, it, but it, it, it sounded really good at the time. Uh, and he said that you can take the world, you can, you can kind of throw that out, you can substitute your name into that, you can substitute your ethnicity into that, you can substitute your social status into that. And he said, that is true. That is true, that is correct. And even though I don't know if that's what John 3.16 was saying, the Bible says that very clearly. And that is amazing news. There, is no, there are no prerequisites for salvation. Right? You don't have to earn this much, be this good, look this way, act this way, have this many friends on Facebook, have this many followers. You don't need anything. Jesus says... There are no prerequisites for the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't screen certain people and say, you I want, you I don't want, you, we'll wait and see. Right? He didn't say that. He says, all are welcome. And if you are here today and you are not a self-identifying Christian, you need to know the glorious truths that we Christians treasure. And that is this, that Jesus wants you, that you are not excluded from the statements that we just made, right? If you think, ah, you know, Christianity is not really for me, you're wrong. You're wrong. Christianity, Christianity is for you because Jesus is for you, right? He is pro you. No matter what you are, he is pro you. He wants you. He wants you into his kingdom. And so come to him. Repent of your sins. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what you look like. He is pro you, for you. He wants you. That's amazing news. If you are not saved, hear these words. He is for you. He wants you. He died for you. He needs you to hear that. And the call for you is to repent of your sins, to have him as your Lord and Savior, be cleansed of your sins, entered into, enter into relationship with him, experience the joys of abundant life in this life and eternal life in the next. Jesus has offered that to all. He made us all. He died for us all. There's no partiality in his sight. He sees us as equals. We are equal. And this is truth. This is bedrock and foundational. And God calls us. He calls us to live in a way to demonstrate the sameness that he has or that he views us in. Uh, to put it uh, in a better way, um, he calls us to love one another without showing partiality because we are to be heralds of the good news of our equality. That Jesus has died for all, and so we must love all. That Jesus has died for all people groups, and so we must love all people groups. You must understand that if you are saying that you are a Christian, that you are saying that I am Christ's representative, right? I am repping Jesus. All you need to do is look at me and you will be able to catch a glimpse of his love and his goodness for you. That's what you're saying if you are saying you are Christian. And since you are saying that, a person ought to be able to look at you, Christian, and they ought to be able to see a glimpse of how Jesus loves And unfortunately, what was happening in James' church was that the rich were being treated in a way that showed them that Jesus loved them, while the poor were being treated in a way which showed them that Jesus did not, did not care. The Christians had rejected the poor, 
And as a result, the poor didn't just think that the church rejected them. The poor thought that God rejected them. Look, in verse 5, James does not say, for has not the church, for was the church not also called to love the poor? He didn't say that. He said, had not God also chosen the poor? Right? The poor had already made the connection. Right? You are supposed to mirror God's love. And so if you don't love me, that means that God doesn't love me. How tragic is that? That whole people groups would think that God is against them. And I say this next sentence with great sorrow. The tragedy that happened in James' church happens in the church and in our culture every week. We are doing the same things as the Christians did in James' church. The only difference is that they marginalize the poor. Right? We not only marginalize the poor, But I believe that in our culture and in our culture of comfort and ease, we marginalize pretty much anyone who is different from us. Right? Those who are different from us socially, those who are awkward a little bit, those who are a little harder to relate to, those who are from a different socioeconomic class, those who are different from us, uh, did I say culturally? Those who have different lifestyles from us, we also marginalize them. And we don't exclude by saying, you know, you, you poor people, right, you sit over there, right, you sit in the back where the late people are, right? And you rich people, you sit up here, right? We don't do that. We're so much more subtle. Right, we say things like, we don't really connect. You know, we just don't have that many things in common. You know, I, I hope that they'll find a place where they will fit in and where they will belong. But I don't think that this place is it. And what we're really saying to them is, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. Get out of here. That's what we're saying. The great tragedy in the church is that hundreds of people will walk into a church today and will walk out thinking that Jesus hates them or doesn't care about them and they'll feel this way because Christians did not extend love and grace towards them. And rather, we extend them. What do you think you're doing here? To the homosexuals, what are you doing here? to those with shady backgrounds. What are you doing here? What's your problem? You want to confess something or something? And we have subtly barred those who are different from us from worship. Now, I'm not saying, and please, please hear this well. James is calling us to treat all people groups the same, which means that we extend friendship and love and warmth to all people groups. He is not saying that repentance is not necessary for salvation. He is not preaching a universalism. He's not saying everybody can be saved, right? There are, there, like he, like he's, not, he's not like that. Right, if you read the book of James, he's actually one of the harshest, one of the harshest guys in terms of reminding us that repentance is necessary. And so we welcome all to worship. And God welcomes all to receive him, but you receive him by repentance of your sins, commitment to him as your Lord and Savior, which means a steady leaving of your lifestyle 
and a steady cl clinging on to his law and his word. So James is not preaching or advocating for universalism or he's not advocating for a licentious lifestyle where, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, you know, you can, like you're in heaven, right? So long as you want to be. That's not what he's saying. He is saying God loves all, he died for all, and all are welcome to repent. And I think somehow we've screwed that up. We've missed that. Um, I, I remember um, so vividly, uh, and, and if I've told this story before, I apologize. Um, but, but that's what I do. I tell stories over and over again. I, I remember so vividly speaking with a woman once, and um, she said, and, and I invited her to church, and she said, um, you know what, uh, you know what, Quan? Like, I'm in a same-sex uh, union, um, and, you know, so, you know, the church wouldn't want anything to do with me, and God doesn't want anything to do with me. And I was like, what? And then we talked for, and we talked for like 45 minutes on, on that one subject alone. Because her whole experience at church has been, I'm a homosexual, I am not welcome here. And that's so tragic. That's so tragic. Are we then saying that one group of sinners are barred from worship? Where are we gonna draw the line? Where are we gonna draw the line? What about the workaholics? What about those who have idolized their works? Will we bar them next? Will we bar those who, uh, will, will, will we bar those who, mm, I don't know, I, I, I can't even think of it because it blows my mind. You know, a question that I've asked myself a lot this week um, is what do newcomers at NTCBC think about Jesus after meeting us? I mean, especially those who are different from us, like culturally, socioeconomically, socially, life stage, life interest. I mean, if you are, okay, so if you are um, a Chinese born, a Canadian born, a Canada born Chinese, right? So here, let me break it down for you. If you're Canada born Chinese, right? If you are in, if you are in or you look like you are in your uh, 20s or 30s, right? You know, like those of us Asian, we could be 50 and look like we're 30, we look like we're 30. It's amazing. So if you look like, if you look like, you know, you are of a certain age range, if you are Canadian born Chinese, so you have that culture, right? If you are middle class, right? Or from a middle class family, if you, um, if you enjoy sports or some variation of sushi or, um, or, or, or baking, um, you know, you, you, you fit in. You, you, you're in. You're in. Right? This, this is your hood. This is, this, this is going to be like your new, and you're going to be like, oh man, everyone's so welcoming and inviting. Oh man, Pastor Connor, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? You know, like a friend that I just invited recently is laughing at me because he said the exact same thing. This is so welcoming because he's in his 20s. He's good looking. Um, he's, you know, middle class, and, and he fits right in. It's amazing. Amazing. Right? But, and so, so I'm not talking about that because we're amazing at that. Amazing at that. So good, you know, right? Good for you. But, but, uh, okay, there are people here. What about the white people? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just being honest. What about those who are, you know, who look like um, they're in their 40s, right? You know, like, you could also have the unfortunate gene I mean, where you're 20 and you look like you're, like, 55, like George Clooney, right? He looked like he was 90 ever since he, you know, passed 40. It's been very unfortunate, but he still looks good. But the point is, what if you don't look like you fit in? What if you don't look like you're from that age? What if you, on an appearance level, aren't there? What if economically, you're not in that class. What if socially, you know, you're also a little awkward, you know, like, you know, you don't make conversation well, and, you know, like, you, you, you kind of, every single time someone talks to you, you kind of just say, uh-huh, yep. 
And I don't, like, do we, how do we treat those? And what do they think about Jesus? And I'm not trying to make fun. I'm actually being serious because the passage today isn't saying, you know, like, you need to treat everybody who's like you well. Like, we all naturally do that easily. It's so simple, so simple. But those who are different from us, would they receive love from us in a way where we would show, uh, that, that, that we would, what, those who are different from us, do they feel and do they receive love? Or are they showed the same kind of love as those who are similar to us? And, and, and I, in all honesty, I struggle to come up with an answer. And I think the fact that I struggle to come up with an answer um, is telling to our condition as a church. And yeah, you know what, guys? I, I know that, I know that it, that it takes more effort to reach out to those who are different, right? I know, right? I know uh, it makes us uncomfortable, and it is hard work. But that's what we're called to do. We have been given the ability to love others by the power of the Holy Spirit, and so there are no longer excuses. We cannot say, I don't have the ability to reach out to those who are different, because you have been. You have been given the Holy Spirit who has infused you with the love of Christ so that you are able to show all his love. So there are no excuses and no Christian is exempt from this call. We are all called to reach out and to make all people groups feel like we are one family. We are one family. And I would, and, and I hope some of you guys aren't thinking this, but for the, for, for the few of you that may be, I don't want us to be using the excuse of, you know, well, we're a Chinese church, and so it's really hard for me to invite my Caucasian friends or my, you know, my, my, my friends from other, you know, like my, my friends from other backgrounds. You know, that's, that's, that doesn't stand here, guys, right? Now, look at me. <laughs> Listen to me. Have you ever heard me speak Cantonese? Have you heard him speak Cantonese? <laughs> For those of you who don't get the joke, he can't speak Cantonese. <laughs> right? It's, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. And so I don't want to hear that excuse. And if, you, if, that, if that came up just like even a little bit, just step on it. It doesn't apply. I had like... 500 words talking about the Chinese church, but I had to get rid of it. <laughs> because I usually ha I, I'm usually wordy and I go over. Um, I'm already over, um, but I still have a page and a half to go. So we had to get rid of that. But that's okay. Um, you need to know that that is not an excuse. It might have been 15, 20 years ago when everything was done, you know, in translation. And, uh, you know, we were, and, and, and services were like three hours long. Uh, but now... It's no longer an excuse. Don't use that as an excuse. The mark and the call of a Christian church and Christians is that we are to love all people groups equally. We are to treat them as we are to treat them as the same. And Pastor James warns us of the seriousness of this call. If we are not doing this, then we are sinning. In verses nine, eight, and nine, we see that uh, James says that. Uh, you are, this is law. This is law, not suggestion. Not, I'll get to it when I get to it. But this is law. And in verses 10 and 11, he goes on and he says that this is, that, that, that if you do not love all people groups, that is, you are a sinner just like those if you cheat on your wives, just like those if you kill people. You're a sinner. That's sinning. And actually, I think this is amazing because uh, this passage shows us that Christians are not just a bunch of people who are, 
who just don't do stuff, right? We're not just a bunch of people who don't cuss, right? Don't drink, right? Don't smoke, right? We don't club, right? We don't, uh, we, 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 we don't have, you know, you know we, 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 we don't have sex with multiple people, right? We, 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 we don't have sex before marriage. We're not just a bunch of people who don't do things. We are, Christ, we, Christians are people who are called to show love, to reach out, to engage, unless we ever forget that. And, or actually, let's not never forget that. Right? We are called as a church to live out the reality of our sameness and that God loves all people. We are to share the gospel with all people. We are to invite all people to church. We are to accept and include all people. And if we do not, we sin. And if we stay in unrepentance, sin, we as a church will be judged. And please do not misunderstand James. He isn't saying that if you don't love others equally that you won't be saved. We are saved not by good works. We are saved by faith in Christ. The judgment that he is speaking of is not of your salvation or your lack of salvation. Rather, he is speaking of the judgment that comes upon a church if they are unrepentant in their sin. Now, James is rather vague on what that judgment looks like, but elsewhere in the Bible, thankfully, uh, we are given a very clear understanding of what that is. And it is simply this, that if a church remains in unrepentant sin, if they are called to obedience, and if they are continuously unrepentant, God will remove their lampstand, meaning that he will shut down the church, uh, meaning that you know, the, chur- the, the, the people or the gathering may still occur, but the power of God, the Spirit of God, will be removed from its midst. That's, and that, we preached on this before when we talked about the church in Ephesus, but that's scary. That's scary. And you guys may think, yeah, that's a little extreme, man. Like, you know, like, that's a little extreme. Yes. It is. But the sin is extreme as well. Keep in mind that if we are disobeying this command, we are mocking God by treading lightly on his commands, and we are actually defaming him by acting out of Christ's character. He'll just, and and he'll, basically, God will just say, I am not that much. What happened? It searches. What I don't want is I don't want it to have this church. Now, I don't want us to end on um, because I don't want to guilt you into has that thick, uh, short term, uh, has had to have you know, you're doing something. If you feel guilty enough, one of those like tuck your ones, get ready, you feel super guilty, you will go back. That works a little while. But the problem with guilt is that guilt is bitter towards God. Guilt leads you to, um, to, to go very insecure about yourself. And both of those things are bad. I tell you the consequences of disobedience is in the Bible, and because I'm beautiful, you are no aware of the cost of disobedience. But I do want us to keep our minds and our eyes on, rather, the call of obedience and the beauty of obedience. There is one motivator in this life that is better than guilt, and that is beauty. Right? I was just thinking about this as I was coming up. I was like, you know, there's only one thing that'll make me um, that 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 that'll make me act quicker or faster or with more, you know, zeal than guilt, and that's beauty. And you can take that for however you want. And I don't think that I am alone. I think that's how God made us, to be moved and to be be driven by his beauty. And so I want us to take the last couple of minutes uh, to look at the beauty of God's command. In verse 5, it said, Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who in the world to rid faith heirs of which he had promised to those who love him? He was not saying this to the people. He was saying this to the Christians. So understand is implicit in this statement. 
He is saying, God has chosen the poor. Let them know that they are chosen by him. Live in a way so that they will know that he has chosen them. That is missions. That is missions. And not just to the poor, but to the outcast, to those who are on the outside of church looking in, to those who don't... If you listen carefully, there is a world out there who is dying to be wanted, dying to be accepted, yearning for what the gospel offers them, yearning for what God offers them, begging for that healing but not knowing where to get it from. And so they turn to whatever popular culture tells them to turn to, to be fixed. They are dying for what God alone can give. And what God says is he has called you to be an agent of healing for them. Not just to soothe their temporary wounds, but to show them that they are loved and accepted and wanted, not only by you, but by Jesus, the one that can satisfy them in this life and save them from punishment in the next and save them for eternity. There are two ways that you can look at what we just said today. You know, you can leave here and think, ugh, I gotta show people that, you know, like I love them because if I don't, then God will be angry at me and God will look bad and, you know, that'll be really bad and, you know, Quan will be angry at me and my small group leaders will be angry at me and, you know, I can't do... And, and you can walk out thinking like that or we can fix our eyes on this reality that God has entrusted to us the task of helping people know just how much he loves them. He wants us to show the world that he, lo- that he loves them through our words and our actions. And if we do, we will most likely get to witness the miracle of healed lives and saved souls. Now, both statements, true, right? If you don't love all people groups, those who are different from you, and show them they belong. That is disobedience. That's true. Right? But let that be a secondary reason or a tertiary reason and not the primary one. Let your primary reason be uh, the resounding beauty of God's mission. Let your primary reason be um, the knowledge uh, that God could have used any means to reveal himself to the world, but he has chosen you. He has chosen to give you a high calling because of his great love for you. He has not only saved you from your sin, but he has saved you for the most important mission in the world. Let that be your drive. God has called us as a church and Christians as individuals to proclaim his awesome love to all people by demonstrating a sameness in the way we love and treat one another no matter who we are. Let us hold firmly to this call so that through our love and care, any and everyone who walks into this church will witness our actions and realize Jesus loves me. What we are going to do now is we are going to do, we are going to take communion. And communion one of the messages of communion is that equality, is that sameness. That's why we all wait for one another uh, before we all take of the bread and take of the drink together. We are now going to practically exercise this sameness. And then after communion, I know that we are way over time. Curtis already told you, don't look at your watches. We're going to be here for a while. We are going to worship and respond to Jesus with song and thanksgiving. So now's the time for communion, um, and we are just going to call uh, Reverend Ted and the deacons up to serve communion, and they will close us off in prayer.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kwan. Wow, I resonated with the whole sermon. I want to encourage you to really take it to heart. Communion is, ask the deacons to come forward. Communion is a, a leveling 